Aloha and welcome to Figments on Reality, Season 1, Episode 3. God, that sounds so official. It is uh, the third episode of this apolitical and uh, uh, hopefully not vitriolic commentary show that I do every other week here on Think Tech Hawaii. And I do it not because I know it all, but because I think about things a lot, have some views I'd like to share as food for thought. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I'd like you to find areas of interest here that you'll examine further. And uh, again, from a non-political perspective, I do a lot of preparation for these shows. And frankly, I'm pretty nervous at the start. I think that's a good thing. I do it because, well, it helps me sound like I know what I'm talking about. It keeps me from, I hope, saying something I'll regret. Because once it's on the web, it's there forever. We should all be as thoughtful before we send that nasty text message or a hateful email reply to something that irritates us. So I think I'm prepared today to talk about diplomacy and the rule of law, two separate topics, not unrelated. Uh, I'll also talk a bit about the Juneteenth holiday, which we just celebrated for the first official time as a nation, and uh, share some news on North Korea, because as many of you know, that's one of my... uh, obsessions, North Korea. So first, uh, let's start with a quick look at what I mean by apolitical and the avoidance of vitriol. Um, Politics permeate everything. And as you can see in the definition here, I try to show no interest or endorsement in political affairs in my commentary, because all that does is feed the fires of vitriol that seem to be engulfing our nation. And I don't want to add to that. Uh, Furthermore, if I put a political twist and implied or actual endorsement to a party, a candidate, or a position uh, to my commentary, then you're going to be less likely to listen to what I have to say. So some people take issue with my lack of a political approach, but um, that's how I do it. And it's my show. I'm not getting paid for it, so I'll do what I want and hopefully have some influence on your thinking in terms of just giving you food for thought. So my first topic today is going to be about diplomacy and the role of U.S. ambassadors. And I'd like to give credit to my wife, Alejandra, who she didn't suggest this topic, but she brought something up that made me think about it. She's from Chile, and there hasn't been a U.S. ambassador filling that post in Santiago for a couple of years. and. Uh, she asked if that means that the U.S. isn't is interested in Chile. And that's not the case. Um, but this is a matter of governing competence. Uh, does our gov- government uh, govern competently? And this is not, absolutely not a political indictment. The fact that 95 of 189 ambassadorial posts are vacant worldwide because both parties have failed here over recent years, quite a long time, frankly. 95 of 189 posts vacant. There are nominees for 10 of those 95, but the rest, we haven't even nominated anybody yet. And again, this failure has has, has been uh, achieved, made by both parties. So it's not a political indictment. Uh, These are really important points. I'm not a diplomat. Nobody would ever uh, mistake me for a diplomat. But as a senior military officer in the Pacific, I saw how important those ambassadors are. Uh, We can't have an influential foreign policy that emanates only from Washington, D.C. And the ambassadors are the focal point for our global diplomacy. Um, They are the most important practitioners of that diplomacy and of U.S. uh, influence in a region. And that's important whether we're talking about a treaty ally, a friend, a relatively neutral nation, or even those we have issues with. The ambassador is the focal point for diplomacy. And if I were elected president, fortunately, there's no danger of that ever happening. But if I were elected president, I think that might be my number one priority, is filling diplomatic posts worldwide at the outset. Um, our ambassadors represent the United States every, every day in the countries they're assigned to. And they don't just do it ceremonially. 
that's important, but also practically. And they represent U.S. citizens who happen to be in those countries. As somebody who spent a lot of time overseas, if there were ever some major problem that I were involved in, I certainly would want an ambassador there. Now, we have um, stand-ins, if you will, chargé d'affaires, who are career diplomats, diplomats generally, and they assume the responsibilities of the ambassadors, but they can't replace the significance of that title and the position. It's not easy to uh, get an ambassador into a post. They have to be nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate, accepted by the host nation, but it's work that has to be done. As I said, they represent us every day. And more importantly, perhaps, their presence or absence is taken by each country and each organization as a measure of interest. Does the U.S. care about name a country or organization? And if, they're at, if we don't have an ambassador in a post, especially for a long time, um, that creates a diplomatic vacuum. And diplomacy, like nature, abhors a vacuum. Somebody will fill that vacuum. And it will be contrasted, contrasted to how other company, countries are represented in the country. And if China has an ambassador in country X and we don't, then we're losing our influence. And I think our, our influence is important, not just to the United States, but to the world. Um, so 95 of 189 ambassador posts. I have the list right here, thanks to uh, the website you see on the slide there, it, you ought to look at it for a couple of reasons. One, you'd be surprised at some of the organizations that have where we have committed to have ambassadorial level uh, representation. And then you'd be shocked by the countries where we don't currently and don't have a nominee. For example, and I'm working in alphabetical order here from my list, Afghanistan. Well, is anything important happening in Afghanistan right now? Yes. Now, there are workarounds. There are deputy assistant secretaries and other officials in the, the Department of State that, um, that can represent us, but not like an ambassador. So Afghanistan, ASEAN, the so Association of Southeast Asian Nations, hugely important in our competition with China. Australia, a treaty ally, important partner. Chile, okay, have to mention that for Alejandro. Uh, but an important uh, South American country that uh, is uh, significantly tied to China economically and a place where we should have influence. Uh, Canada, <laughs> they kind of matter because uh, they're our neighbor. And speaking of neighbors, let me slip, skip down the list alphabetically and see that we don't have an ambassador nominated or present for Mexico. With the border crisis, uh, again, not political counter, but that's a pretty important place to leave vacant. Um, some of the other key areas, the European Union. After the summit recently, you'd think that would be a place we represented. France, Germany, and NATO all have vacant ambassadorial posts. And by the way, this is current as of May 24th, so anything's changed, I missed it. India and Indonesia, looking at the eyes on the list, two most populous Muslim nations on the planet, believe it or not, and uh, both important partners economically and in security matters, vacant. Japan, another treaty ally. Uh, the Philippines, a lot of Southeast Asia unrepresented here. Singapore, South Korea, Northeast Asia. We're going to address the North Korea matters. We ought to have an ambassador there. Thailand, the United Kingdom, and Vietnam has a nominee but doesn't have an ambassador present. I, I personally view our relationship with Vietnam as one of the most important bilateral relationships the country has. And here's one of the organizations where I think we absolutely put, should put priority on uh, having an ambassador of the United Nations Human Rights Council. We have to put our diplomats where our mouth is. And if we think it's important, we have to find uh, the right people to serve, get them nominated and confirmed. Once again, 
not an indictment of this administration. It's observation that the United States has not done well at filling these key diplomatic uh, posts for some time. And it is, uh, it's a risk we're taking because the void will be filled. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about Juneteenth, our newest holiday. Uh, the 19th of June, celebrated officially on Friday. And uh, I was, frankly, kind of surprised how quickly this became a holiday. All right, that's bad on me. Shame on me for thinking that. It's been under discussion for a long time, including in the last administration. Um, but finally, it's a holiday. And uh, quickly is not the word because it only took 156 years for this to be established from the event that uh, it celebrates the final end of slavery in the United States. By the way, it's first new US holiday since Martin Luther King Day was established uh, back in 1983. And that means our past two national holidays have addressed the issue of race in the United States. And I hope that's a th something that will help continue to heal our nation because we need that healing. There has been some debate, should it be a holiday? Do we need another holiday, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But let me just say this, when I think about slavery, oh man, um, I've got a newspaper clipping here, Negroes for sale. Can you imagine being sold as property? I can't. Um, it, it's incredibly tragic. And the end of that should be something that we do celebrate. So happy Juneteenth. Next year, I'll be better prepared for it. And I hope we'll, as a nation, celebrate this holiday with the significance it deserves. All right. Um, quick break, as always, to plug my next figments, uh, The Power of Imagination, coming up. Uh, in a week at 2 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time on Think Tech Hawaii. Honey, I bought a race car. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this. A uh, high school friend of mine did exactly that in his mid-50s. It's a great story, and it's really a, a interesting study of following your dream and making your figment reality. And he's got some tremendous anecdotes from, an, anecdotes from uh, buying a race car which he did. So on to the rule of law. I, uh, I think a lot about the law and how, what a legalistic society we've become. Juneteenth, in fact, became a holiday uh, via the Juneteenth uh, National Independence Day Act, an act of law, and that's how you make holidays. Uh, but the concept of rule of law, I think, is one of the most important ideas in the world. Uh, and certainly in the United States, because it is the principle, as you see, that people and institutions are subject to and accountable to law that's fairly applied, and it's government by law. There's a contrasting principle that we find in some countries around the world, and that's rule by law, where a government or a ruling body or party or dictator uses laws to control the people but is not equally held accountable to those laws. And um, that's really a huge difference and something that the U.S. has promoted broadly in uh, Indo-Asia Pacific when we talk about a free and open Indo-Asia Pacific, we talk about the rule of law. And so uh, I think it's a great principle, but I also think we have too many laws and that we have become overly legalistic. The Pre the proliferation of legal re uh, regulation of issues big and small, I think, fuels the divide in the United States, the societal disharmony, if you will. We just have too many laws. And I don't know how you want to do that. <laughs> okay, folks, I I'd like to propose a solution, but kind of hard to unmake a law. It's hard to repeal a law. Uh, regulations are sometimes repealed by executive order at the federal level and then reinstated or re, uh, repealed, et cetera. 
and uh, it, once you get all these laws, you're kind of stuck with them. Um, and I think there are a couple problems to that. One is that these laws are often at the wrong level, and we need better discipline in our legislative bodies, regardless of political party, about is this a matter that should fall under the purview of the state government, the local government, or the federal government? And um, not speaking politically, but speaking little, um, sort of uh, philosophically, uh, there should be a fairly conservative approach to crossing those boundaries. There's a reason for the separation of powers between um, local, state, and federal governments, and that's some to allow uh, people of localities to live by their rules within reason when the matter being addressed is um, one that is local in nature. Yeah. So I think we've crossed those boundaries uh, a lot, and I think we've made too many laws, and because we've made too many laws, everything becomes litigation. When all, all forms of behavior are uh, legally governed, then the only way to solve a disagreement is through litigation, through the courts. And let's see, if you're going to the courts, hmm, that means you're taking sides. You have to take sides. There's a plaintiff and a defendant. And um, when we get to micro -le legal regulation, we absolve ourselves of all of our own personal responsibility to, uh, to address and solve disagreements on a personal level and give it to the courts. And again, I think this is something that is fueling the disharmony in the United States. And if you've got a solution, please drop me a line at info at phase minus one.com, info at phase minus one.com. I don't have a solution, but I think it's a problem. And I'd really appreciate your thoughts. Um, next, a little bit about North Korea. As you know, I'm obsessed with North Korea and North Korea matters. And there was some good news today. I got that good news from nknews.org and not a plug for them, but oh, yeah, well, I guess it is. Very good website. They have a great podcast. I believe I've mentioned it on other shows. Um, and uh, I encourage you to take a look and to listen to what they put out because it's quite diverse in covering North Korea and provides insight that I haven't found anywhere else. So the news is that um, the uh, Sun Kim, our North Korea policy representative, uh, has said that the U.S. is willing to meet with North Korea anywhere, anytime. Wow. Without precondition. Wow. Let me read this. We hope here's a follow on to his statement. We continue to hope that the DPRK will positively respond to our outreach and our offer to meet anywhere, anytime without preconditions, Sun Kim said. He was at a meeting with his South Korean and Japanese counterparts. I think that's great. This is a, a festering problem that has festered far too long to the US and Japan and South Korea's peril in a security sense and to the human peril of the common North Korean people. So it's great, but guess what, folks? It is absolutely not enough. It isn't enough to simply say, uh, we'll meet, because we've said that before. In fact, Sung Kim, who filled this current role previously, said much the same before. The problem is North Korea has enacted upon that, and they're unlikely to respond in any way productive uh, to this outreach. The United States has to do something innovative and uh, aggressive in a diplomacy sense if we're going to make any progress to solving the North Korea problem. And uh, I've written extensively about it. Many of you may have seen some of the articles, papers, and interviews I've done on it. But the United States has to find something that isn't transactional, uh, isn't a concession or a negotiation, and give a reason to meet. Now, the previous president, President Trump, did that, and it's arguable the effect of that, but he did actually engage with uh, North Korea. 
Um, I'm not suggesting that that approach is something that President Biden is likely to take or even that he should take. But I think that the United States has to take some action that will inspire dialogue and get us out of this stalemate that has gone on since 1953. What kind of actions would I suggest? Um, well, I'd say we should pursue an end to the war, uh, a uh, war ending agreement. And currently we're under an armistice, so this war is technically still there and we should address that uh that's not easy none of this is easy but we have to take some initiative i'd also suggest as i have in the past uh that the u.s and south korea take joint action to relook the maritime boundaries of north korea now this would benefit north korea okay? it would if they if their maritime boundaries were normalized they would benefit from it but the current boundaries are not in sync with any of the, the uh, law of the sea approaches taken elsewhere. The United States has promoted the law of the sea and the UNCLOS Treaty, the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, even though we haven't ratified it. Another question of government competence, but it is what it is. We still believe in the principles of it and have made it a matter of policy through mo multiple uh, administrations, um, but that does not seem to apply to North Korea. That needs to be fixed. If we're going to be credible as a nation touting the rule of law at sea, then we must apply universally and not make a North Korea exception. I still believe it's very important to make our long-term goal uh, denuclearization of North Korea uh, we can't simply accept the fact that they have nuclear weapons, one, because that's quite dangerous, but it's more dangerous than just with regard to North Korea. Uh, accepting the North Korea as a nuclear state would mean we stop caring about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, one of the most important treaties in my lifetime. And we can't walk away from that. We can't say it's okay to leave the treaty as North Korea did. Since the treaty was enacted, four states have gotten nuclear weapons. The other three, Israel, India, and Pakistan, were not signatories. North Korea was. And we simply can't afford to, uh, to say, uh, oh, that's fine. That's fine. That treaty doesn't matter that much. So focus on, uh, keep our long-term strategic focus on uh, denuclearization in North Korea. But at the same time, let's find something to talk about. And we have to entice North Korea to talk because they're not going to do it on their own volition. One other area that I suggested is uh, in an interview with a Asia Global Online is providing vaccines to North Korea. And now that we've pled, made a huge pledge of vaccines for global distribution, that's one place we should consider. But we can't just say we're willing to meet anywhere, anytime and think that anything will come of that. So um, that's what I think about North Korea today. Uh, I usually start in my the previous two episodes, if that's usual, with a come on, man, in the news, where I find something totally ridiculous in the news and uh, put it forward like they do on NFL uh, pregame shows. I have some bad news, folks. Two weeks of looking. And I came up empty. Now, does that mean that there's any there there isn't anything ridiculous in the news? No. The problem is everything that was ridiculous had a political undertones to it, and both sides of the political spectrum, by the way. But we need the media to come up with other ridiculous stories that have nothing to do with politics. If I'm going to keep doing, come on, man, in the news. So, um. That is everything I wanted to talk about today. Remember, next week we'll have uh, Figment's The Power of Imagination. If you missed my last episode uh, last Monday, you can find it on the playlist. It was with Lieutenant Colonel Slick Aguirre. Boy, was, I thought it was a great episode, and not because of me. He's a great guy. And he's a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he was an F-15 pilot, a friend of mine in the F-15 world, who's flown everything. But his description of being a 19-year-old Huey 
aircraft commander flying combat in Vietnam was riveting and thoughtful. And I encourage you to take a look at the playlist and uh, do that. So let me close with what would Fig do? Fig would think about diplomacy and look at where our ambassadors are and encourage our government through letters, however you'd like to do it, to fill those important posts. It's at our peril if we don't. So thanks for watching. Remember, Think Tech Hawaii makes figments on reality uh, and figments the power of imagination possible is a 5013C, I think I get the numbers and letters right, nonprofit corporation entirely dependent on your generous contributions. And if you go to their website, you'll see they have content that's extraordinarily diverse, interesting, funny. It's a great connection for the community. So please support Think Tech Hawaii. I'll see you next week in Figments, uh, uh, The Power of Imagination. In two more weeks, we'll bring back more reality and hopefully a new, come on, man, aloha.